So um, I'm uh, Gareth, I'm the Head of Insight and Research at NHS Blood and Transplant, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how Acorn and Footfall Data and the Insight Tool are supporting, supporting us in meeting the RO Blood Challenge. So um, a little bit about me, I've been working in data and analysis since 2004, initially for the Met Police and then latterly for the NHS Blood and Transplant, and since the start I've been using GIS or mapping packages. Um, at the moment, I currently lead a team of six data analysts and scientists focusing on donor behaviour and their transactions and interactions with us. Um, the teams work varies from everything from digital analytics on looking at website performance to larger scale data science projects. And away from work, I like riding on my old vintage rally bikes and I like old film cameras and I'm a bit of a transport geek. So I thought I'd share a nice picture of an old bus take with my trusty Trip 35. So a little bit about NHS Blood and Transplant. We're probably not that well known. Uh, we're created in 2006 as a merger between the National Blood Service or National Blood Transfusion Service and UK Transplant. And we are part of the NHS, which turns 70 years old this year, or 75, sorry. But we're, the blood part certainly is, much old, is a little bit older than the NHS. We predate it. We were formed in 1946 by the RAF after the Second World War and our roots date back over a century. We were we can trace our roots back to 1922 and Dulwich, when a uh, civil servant uh, named Percy Lane Oliver founded the world's first blood transfusion service. And what NHS Blood and Transplant does is we provide a blood and transplantation service to the NHS. We provide blood donation services in England. Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland have their own independent services, but we provide transplantation of organs and tissues across the whole of the UK. And today I'm going to be focusing on a blood donation challenge. So a little bit more about us, we, in terms of blood, we collect one and a half million units of blood a year from approximately 800,000 donors. We have around 26 fixed centres, which um, if you know our West End one, just by Oxford Circus, they're fixed sites, usually on a high street or a hospital, and about 1,300 mobile ones, which are usually set up in church halls, sports halls, those sort of places. We also collect uh, platelets, which is a product from blood that helps with clotting, particularly useful for cancer patients. We collect about 65,000 units a year from around 13,000 donors, all at donor centres. We also collect around 17,500 units of plasma from around 6,000 donors on three fixed sites. We, in terms of organs, we have far less. Um, we do about oh, just over 4,000 organs are transplanted and that comes from approximately 1,400 deceased donors. However, the organ donor base register is huge. It's about 25 million people are on the organ donor register. In terms of blood donors, we have around 5 million records on our Pulse database of blood donors, plus another 5 million or so in the archive. We're obliged to keep blood donation records for 30 years, which is why it's so large. And we have around 5,000 staff, three processing centers, and one tissue bank. And one of the challenges we're going to, I'm going to talk about today is sickle cell or sickle cell disorder. It's about 15,000 people in the UK have the, have the disorder, and this mainly affects people of African and Caribbean descent. It's an inherited blood disorder which causes misshapen red blood cells. So like that one on the far right, you can see that sickle cell. And these occasionally block the blood vessels and they restrict blood flow and cause very painful crises. And these crises are so intensely painful that many of the sufferers are given morphine in hospitals. It can shorten life expectancy if not treated, but many sufferers in the UK now live to adulthood and they have both children and grandchildren. Around 300,000 people in the UK have the sickle cell trait, which means they have no symptoms, but they can pass the disorder onto their descendants. So there's about a one in four chance of someone with the sickle cell trait if they meet another person with sickle cell trait, having a child who could have sickle cell disorder. So this is quite a fast, it's a rapidly growing um, disorder. It's, I believe it now has more people suffering with it than perhaps cystic fibrosis, which is probably a better well-known disorder. One of the main treatments for sickle cell is a blood transfusion. And sufferers of sickle cell often describe the blood transfusion as like having an oil change. And basically they take out the misshapen blood cells replace it with healthy blood cells. The blood type we most, the best clinical match for it is a blood type called RO. It's a very rare blood type found around 2% of the population nationally. Over five years we've seen a 37% increase in the amount of RO blood requested for hospitals. 
Where we can't meet that, we substitute with other blood groups that are clinically acceptable. But over time, if we can't get the blood matched perfectly, it leads to, it makes transfusions harder and some people may become untransfusable, which gives a worse clinical outcome to those patients. In 21-22, about 50% of RO blood requests for hospitals were substituted with other clinically acceptable groups. So this is the size of our challenge we're facing. But the challenge we've been set for about the past, well, it's been going for about the last five years, is that we need to recruit more donors from the black community to grow our RO donor base significantly so that we reduce the amount of substitutions that we do. RO blood is found in around 2% of the general population, but up to 60% of some people from certain African communities and around 40% of, from some Caribbean communities. So this is why we are reaching out to these communities to ask them to donate blood. One of the challenge, another challenge is that with our traditional marketing, these communities may be quite hard to reach for the NHS. And there may be a number of reasons for that from historic um, health discrimination that's gone on for probably the last 150 years. And the fact that we've always focused on the general population and mainly recruiting people in the shires uh, and market towns uh, of rural England. And the other challenge is virtually all marketing tools don't really focus on ethnicity, quite rightfully. So we've got to try and find a way to identify areas to target, identify communities to target, but not, we're not able to use traditional marketing tools. And our footprint, so our place, is traditionally, as I mentioned, in the suburbs and sh in the shires and market towns. We're not, we don't tend to be in in the big cities, which makes the challenge a bit harder. Particularly, we've always had a smaller presence in London. So what we did is we used the Insight tool to start to plan our marketing strategy. So where we are going to display adverts, both physically and virtually, and where we are going to run events. So you might see a stall set up in a station uh, asking people to recruit blood and where we will be doing outreach events with the local communities. So as I mentioned, ACORN data doesn't really have a focus on ethnicity. So what we did is we used the data that is taken from the census and updated each year by CACI and the Insight tool. And we were able to map that and create hotspot maps of where the densest population of people from the black community live. And we we're able to work out which areas of the country we should be targeting. And we we're able to do hotspot mapping techniques and we're able to adjust the hotspotting sort of boundaries so that in a place like London, where they, uh, the population is much denser, we can only focus on the really densely populated areas, but we also do not miss any areas in other towns and cities like Leeds or Nottingham, where the population is less dense. And what we did is we used this data as well to help replan our footprint. We've got 1,300 mobile sessions. They can, be quite, they can move about. So we started to move those sessions about and open up a new mobile team in South East London to try and reach out to those communities. We also used a matrix to do donor centre planning. So during the pandemic, we started collecting convalescent plasma at a multitude of sites operated at pace as part of a clinical trial. But we did want to open up new donor centres and out of that there was a request to open up new donor centres, particularly in London, and ideally to tackle the RO challenge. And what we're able to do is take the data in insights. So we were able to use some ACON data, some ethnicity data. We're also able to upload our blood donor data, any other data we can get, combine it in insight, and then download it into a good old fashioned Excel spreadsheet and create a scoring matrix. And with that scoring matrix, we're able to identify a number of centers that would be ideal for a new donor center. We two came out really strongly they were Westfield Stratford and Westfield Shepherd's Bush. Luckily, due to the pandemic, we were able to actually get space in those two centres. And in autumn 2020, we opened up in Stratford. And then in the spring of 21, we opened up in Shepherd's Bush. Those centres are still running now. They're doing very productively. And you'll see at the end the sort of successes we've had there. However, although we've opened up the sort of Westfield centres on either end of the central line, there's always been a desire to open up a centre We've also had feedback from our partners or charities or community groups that we really should be seen to have a centre in the heart of the community to serve the community and to reach out to the community. So we're always aiming to plan a centre in South London. And using Insight, we're able to map a lot of data. So we've got the ethnicity data hotspotted. 
And that data there represents the top 10% of um, post postal sectors where, with the highest number of, um, the highest volume of the black population in the area. And the darkest red represents the top 1%. So we're able to really target the areas down using hotspot mapping. But then we're able to overlay data. We're able to overlay, I'm not quite sure it's shown up here, but you can see there's, we we're able to hotspot the railway station traffic to see where the density of footfall is. We're able to use, um, the green is the footfall catchments, we're able to use that to just look where the local visitors and local residents are and hotspot the high streets there. So in addition to using the, R, the retail scores that's already loaded in there, we can say, well actually Croydon may have the highest retail score, or Bromley may have, but actually where we want to be is places like Brixton and Lewisham because they may not have the retail score or the retail spend, what they do have is high footfall from all the traffic through the station but also that's where the local residents are going and you can, I'm not sure it's showed up quite well, but there's a much darker intense green. So we're able to use that to identify areas for our property teams to search and to look for new premises to open up a new donor center. The top three locations were Brixton, Peckham and Lewisham. We've had a number of hurdles in terms of finding properties. Um, sometimes there were no properties available uh, one landlord was quite happy to open up a blood donor centre, but he didn't really want the general public going on, which was a bit of a challenge for us. So <laughs> those are the sort of things we've come up against. But fingers crossed, we are hopefully op planning on opening a new South London donor centre in a prime site late autumn, early December, hopefully December time. But fingers crossed, I'm sure you'll hear more of it. We, we aim to get a press release out, so hopefully you'll hear a little more. I can't really say much until it's all confirmed. And in terms of using insight, you know, what are the challenges we've had? I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have is poor questions. I'm sure any analyst in the room knows that there's nothing worse than someone asking a bad question for you to try and work out. And for us, in terms of donation, just not giving us a focused challenge to focus. We know if you want to recruit donors to, to, uh, with RO blood, we know exactly where we should go. But if you want to vague, make that question more vague and say, we would like to collect RO blood, but we'd also like to collect plasma, or platelets, then it's a very different demographic. For example, plasma donors tend to be men who are over 50, and they tend to be in the ABC1 demographic. So we'd be looking at a totally different area for a donor center. So if someone doesn't give us a clear question, we can't give them a clear answer. Thankfully, we were asked a very clear question, able to give a really, really clear answer. So the other challenge we had is our facilities team and their estate agents just weren't used to the precision we could give. We could say, they were used to us saying, Here's a town, go find us a site in Chichester. And we're saying, please find us in these three streets in Lewisham. And they just were not able to do it. They were not used to it. If we asked them to search in Brixton, they'd be giving us sites in Clapham. And then coming back to us, well, why are you so picky? But ha thankfully having the data from ACOR, we had to show them those maps and say, this is where we want to be. This is why we want to be here. Really helped change the arguments. There's always going to be a bit of an element of my town is best. Um, years ago, we tried opening up centres in the West Midlands, and there was a, a very senior manager from Solihull who was, couldn't understand why we were recommending Wolverhampton and Coventry, not Solihull. So you're always going to get that bias. When we're looking at South London, there is one manager in particular who is totally focused on Croydon. We can show the evidence why we, would, we wouldn't recommend Croydon, but even so, there's always, we're always going to have that sort of my town is best element. And there is some element of product bias. Some very senior managers don't always know of CACI, and they may have other preferred products. So it's very important that we explain to them how robust CACI is, how good the product is, how we can work with CACI to build up the trust so they know that the data we're using is rigorous and of good quality. And in terms of outcomes, well, what, you know, I suppose it's a so what now. So Stratford, in three years, is now the second biggest donor centre in England. The only place bigger than it is the one at Oxford Circus. Shepherd's Bush is now the sixth largest donor centre in terms of total donors. It's bigger than our centres in Leeds and Manchester. They've been phenomenally successful. If we're looking at RO blood and recruiting donors from the black community, Stratford has now the most donors. It has been a phenomenal success in terms of pushing the RO challenge and closing that gap between collections. Shepherd's Bush is now the third largest. We've grown the number of RO donors nationally by 22%. And we've managed to grow the number of donors from the black community in London by 63% since 2020. 
but that's, that's success, that's okay, but actually there's still more to do. If we're still having to substitute 50% of blood requests, we need to recruit more. So we still need thousands more new RO donors to meet our demand. We, I've mentioned there's a plans donor centre in South, South East London. We've got a challenge from the DH Department of Health to open up a new donor, six new donor centres very quickly. So we're using insight and similar methodologies to come up with new sites there. And when we open up a new centre, it creates opportunity for smaller mobile centres. So if we open up a new centre in South London, we'll be able to then, the team that goes to Lewisham, say, six times a year, that's six place, other places they can go to in that year. So we'll be using insight to just work out at a very granular level where the next church ought to go to, where the next sports club to go to. So there's still more work to do. We've done well, but there's still more work to do, and we'll be using insight to carry on doing that. And finally, um, thank you for listening, and a quick plug. So if you haven't already signed up to the Organ Donor Register, the link's there. And please, if you have done, have a conversation with your families and let them know your wishes, as that really increases the chance of the family respecting your um, family uh, making the decision for you, because you can't always make the decision for as an organ donor. And um, if not, there's also blood.co.uk, probably the easiest website to remember if you'd like to sign up or donate blood. Thank you.